park of the Well <laughs> We're back at the uh back at the office for another another edition of the um the lockdown. Um yesterday I, I tried to provide all of the most humorous and interesting things that I could possibly put into this um, 15 minutes of, of live Facebook video type of thing. So I've used up all my material, but I will, of course, try to keep you entertained for, uh, you know, a relative amount of time. Now, you see, I'm in an office here because I'm a... <laughs> I'm, a, I'm keeping social distance. I'm a journalist. <laughs> See, we're both we're both journalists. Serious, serious journalists. There, this we are involved. We are we work in a journalist environment, but she's not supposed to enter my office because it's Sorry. a quarantine zone. Um, we're actually the only people, <laughs> I think, at this office that used to employ. Well, it still employs people, but it used to have, I don't know. 20 people, 30 here, and I think that we are now the only people left. So some people have have compared this lockdown um, type of situation thing, isolation, depression, prison-like environment that we have all been uh, pushed into, as similar to the film Alien, where, if you recall the first one, they're all stuck on a ship. It's a very large ship, but they live in a very small part of it. And then, by and by, the alien eats them all. I think until Sigourney Weaver is the only person that is left. So, yes, in some ways, being in this gigantic office building with almost no people in it, you could say it's comparable to that. The only difference, of course, being that there are no um, no aliens that are going to eat us. Um, which I guess brings us to an important point. What, what are the best movies to watch during the pandemic? What films or series have you gone back to rewatch and seen all sorts of interesting new details in? Like... I went back and watched The Godfather again. And it's extraordinary the degree to which when you're stuck in a sort of prison-like lockdown in isolation type of thing, the number of, of little details that you start to see because your life has become so narrow and so detail-oriented. I think one of the side effects of this, um, this situation is that we, um, because we're all uh, confined in general to smaller areas, even in, in areas that you, you can no longer go too far from your house to exercise, so <laughs> you become a bit more detail-oriented, i.e., for instance, you might notice uh, a flower or a tree that you would not have noticed prior to that. So... It's interesting if you go back and watch some of these movies, uh, some of the details. Just to revisit, for instance, the Alien, <laughs> the Alien series again. If anyone who remembers, the original Alien takes place, let's say, whatever time it takes place in, 2200 or something. In Aliens, the, the next one, when they find Sigourney Reaver's uh, capsule thing, you remember... Like something like, I think, I don't know, 60 years or something has gone by between the the end of the first one and the second one. But she's been in a cryogenic sleep. So she, so for her, no time has, has disappeared, right? But if you go back and watch Aliens, the premise is that during that time, that place, LV-426, the planet has been colonized or whatever, right? By these, uh, whatever they were, terra farmers. Now, wait. She, her ship is discovered. She's brought back to the kind of space station thingy that's off of, floating off of Earth. And the, the company that she used to work for, 
remember the the company that had, had sent them there in the first place. She, it's the same company, even though it's been sixty years. Now hold on a minute. That it's true that a corporation might survive for sixty years, but there's a there's still a flaw in this because if you recall. She she's debriefed and they basically during the debriefing, they say, well, you know, you destroyed this N class star freighter. It was a huge amount of money. What a waste. Um, and we're going to take away your flight license or something like that. Now, hold on a minute. It's been like 60 years. How could she possibly? Um, why? What, why does it matter? To take away her flight license. She wouldn't have been qualified to fly the types of uh, interstellar spacecraft that existed at that time anyway, because surely over 60 years, you would have had a whole bunch of changes in the, in the configurations of these star freighters and things, right? So wh why would they have to take away her license at all? Why would it matter? Sh she's not qualified anyway. Sh she, would have to, she would have had to go back to flight school. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's like if someone told you that a pilot from like the Vietnam era was in cryogenic sleep and woke up today and they were like, well, sir, you know, it's very nice that you used to, used to, used to fly the F-4s, but well, we're going to take away your flight status because we don't, you know, you destroy that aircraft. They wouldn't, wouldn't they have just said, yeah, you're not really qualified to fly an F-35, so you'll have to go back to train. So the whole premise of the aliens second version is that she's like down on her luck and then they tell her, well, listen, we've got these Marines going in and this, the, we, we've lost contact with the colony. Um, could, you, could you please join the mission? And she's like, well, yeah, because, because my life's no longer good. I, I'm now working as – she's working in like construction or something, right? So she's like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And there's that jackass guy that comes and he says, well, you know, we, you could get back on the horse by doing this. And she's like, well, yeah, okay, I guess. The whole premise doesn't make sense. Uh, it's fine that she has to go. The premise, obviously, she has to go back and do whatever she's going to do, which is fine. But um, anyway, whatever. I have to say one thing. Going back to watch The, the Godfather w was interesting because I did, I did get to notice, you know, some, some just small details, for instance, like, you know, after they kill or after they try to assassinate the Don, the family gathers and there's that great scene where um and what's his name? Fat Clemenza is there and he's he's trying to teach them teach the Michael how to make the how to make the sausages and the and the um the dish. Which which is just a great which is just a really great scene because it's there are not enough films out there where you get to see people cooking. And it's nice the juxtaposition that these like mafiosi or whatever to, to the, the juxtaposition with the cooking, which is a running theme in, in many mafia films that there's food involved. But I think the fact that they took time to go through the whole process of the well, you got to put some sugar and you're going to put the tomatoes and you're going to put the sausages. I thought that was really great. There's another scene I think soon after that or maybe prior to it where you see all of them sitting uh, in a room. And that's when they're still trying to figure out what happened to Luca Brozzi. Now, it's interesting because Michael's in that scene. The, the, his back is to the camera. And he, there's a bit of mumbling that goes back and forth, which I thought was, if you watch it a few times, you, you see that there's a bunch of bits of little subtext there that I think are, are interesting to, um, to go back and look at. It's also interesting that when Luca... When they bring the fish uh, that, that, that symbolizes Luca sleeping with the fishes, they bring it wrapped inside Luca's um, his kind of bulletproof vest that he was wearing or whatever it was, his stab vest. Which is interesting because if you then remember when you go back to see Luca before he even bothers to go to try to infiltrate the uh, whatever that family is, Salazzo and them, you, know, you, get, you see him putting that on, which is one of those little details which... Also, if you rewatch it, you you see those little details and you think, oh, that's interesting. I just realized that he was wearing that vest. It doesn't help him, of course, because he gets strangled. So having it wasn't entirely clear why he wore the vest in the first place. He was such a big guy. I mean, it's not entirely clear 
that they would have made a vest that would have fit him. Um, but according to the film, the, the vest did, did fit him. Um, I don't know what it was. Yeah, it was not entirely clear what they thought it would protect him from. I mean, well, did he think that they'd shoot him? I mean, in the end, they just stabbed him in his hand and strangled him. So it didn't turn out very, um, very well for, uh, for Luca. Anyway, um, for all of those seven people who are watching this, although yesterday we got not a bad turnout afterward. I think about 50 people watched it. Not bad. Um, I am sitting at work in my illustrious office. For people that didn't get to see the, my beautiful, exotic office um, before, there's a door, which is nice. There is, some, uh, there is a very nice calendar that I got from the Chinese embassy. It says, lucid waters and lush mountains are invaluable assets. Now that's, that was obviously prior to the, uh, this whole unfortunate pandemic. I have my, my books and I have my helmet for covering riots. I have my prayer rug. I have my fake grass, which is very important. And I have my wall of, of honor, uh, which includes... Uh, prayer beads, stuff from Ukraine, Kurdistan. Uh, there's a picture of Lord Wingate up there, um, and a bunch of other knickknacks and junk. Um, I have my uh, traditional Santa hat. There used to be a bottle of whiskey in this office, but people kept stealing it and drinking it, so I got rid of it. Um, there is also a bunch of other little knickknacks, like a model Humvee and uh, things from Serbia and. Russia, and uh, I don't even know. There's a brick from Iraq. There's also a small Nixon doll. I mean, I got that at the Nixon Library out there in... I think it's in Yorba Linda, or someplace where he used to live. So that is my exotic, wonderful office. Uh, as I tried to explain yesterday, I am one of this um, very small class... Of what, of what is called essential workers because I'm, I work in journalism. So we are allowed out of the prison, of the lockdown, to go to work. Uh, we, are only, we, are, we, are, we must go directly to work and then we must go directly home. We must not stray from, our, um, stray from the, uh, the route. I, I'm, I'm surprised. I think at some point they maybe make a people you know, file their routes with the government so that you, they will know which route you will be on. It's a bit different than the Chinese model of the lockdown. <laughs> what they did there was everyone had to download certain things on their phones linked to, I guess, this Alipay or whatever WeChat thing. And then your phone is flagged as to whether you're healthy or not or in the middle or something so that you are a member of several classes. And if you're one of the green phone holders, your flag is green, which is then you can do certain things or travel or whatever. Um, it's unclear, I think, entirely what has actually happened out there. But th there are different methods, obviously. There is, um, there is uh, kind of Singapore, South Korea. We, we don't really know what's going on there. I don't think that it's entirely... There are new studies based on the Singapore model looking at whether it's been successful or not. I do think that... Most of what goes on in our countries or in these other places is that we just don't know what the hell is going on. So we don't know, in a sense, I mean we don't know because we don't know what we don't know. We, don't, we do know uh, certain things about the numbers in certain places, but we don't know necessarily, you know, exactly what they've done. I don't think most of governments in the West, uh, I, just, I happen to be in Jerusalem, but there are many governments obviously have chosen different uh, actions. I'm not entirely sure that they have gone to places like Singapore to South Korea to study exactly what worked or didn't work or whatever. It seems that most of what's going on is quite is quite reactionary. So we are we are well, most of us are victims of this reaction in a sense. Uh, it you, may be a good a good type of victimhood in the sense that it ostensibly is designed to protect us, but anyway, it's not entirely clear. And I think and well, anyway, we'll never know because 
because most of us anyway are locked down and we can't really find out and you know we can't obviously travel there probably for the next year or 10 years or something <laughs> so that's unfortunate um if you're just joining in I, this is not only my illustrious office but this is my I, I, this is my computer that i i check the email of i am very proud of the fact that i every day make sure to have zero unread messages and i i purge all the messages that are on my desktop every day uh i mean this is this is my work computer so it's my work email but i i refuse to have anything in my inbox i i, I don't i just it's unacceptable i i don't think i can't look at an inbox that has massive numbers of messages it just i i i categorize them all and i move them somewhere i can't have them there I, w I wish I could do the same system with my home email. For some reason, my home email has like tens of thousands of messages and is a huge mess. But, but my work email, I'm extremely systematic about trying to to make sure that it is um, it is fully fully dealt with and contained. And uh, and that's uh, that's difficult because I I receive all these submissions. I think we get about I don't know fifty submissions a day or a hundred or something. Mm -hmm. I try to get rid of most of them. Most of the submissions these days are obviously about this whole, the whole virus, the virus thing. It's kind of the only thing anyone talks about, it seems like. Um, which, of course, is totally understandable because we are all either involved in the pandemic, locked down, or about to be locked down, or something. So it's, of course, totally understandable that that would be, like, the, the only information that we deal with uh, about 24-7. Although I think that, in general, it's not really good on people's health to uh, focus on this all day, every day. I think that it probably is slowly eroding people's um, mental states a bit. I assume over the long term, if it continues like that, they will have to... Uh, they should try to find a way to help help these help people to focus on something else. I mean, because you know, there's no sports now. <laughs> All those usual populist types of things that we were used to distracting us. I mean, I don't really watch sports, but there's someone obviously watches it. So. All those types of things have, have kind of gone by the wayside. I mean, there are not going to be sports seasons, right? I mean, like if you're like a basketball fan or a baseball or a hockey, whatever, it's not going to happen, right? I mean, they're going to, they're going to, it's not, you can watch the last season. Um, You know, what? they're not going to be new, what, music tours. I mean, any of those things that people used to um, do for what populist entertainment or whatever, it's all finished, right? I mean, you can't... It's done. There won't be any of that. So I, I guess that, that that will have a long-term effect. I mean, we will have... Um, we'll have less of those types of... Uh, I mean, I personally just don't care about pop music and sports and things anyway, but I just... I would assume that most many people care... They make movies like Moneyball about it, so people care about it. Uh, but I assume that the long-term effect is that you just won't have that. They're not going to have the Olympics. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> no Olympics. So you know, I mean, it's. Uh, I would think that that it's it's a combination that have factors of like one is that you're ninety percent of what goes on in your life is like coronavirus, and then. Whatever other things you thought, well, yeah, but you know, okay, but I, what about this? I could watch. No, 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 that's all gone as well. So, it's uh, it's 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 a problem because it, there will be less entertainment, um, and so the only thing you can go back and do is watch old movies. And I already in this live Facebook live thing, if you, you can re rewind this tape, and you'll get my whole speech about the. Uh, the inconsistencies in Alien and Aliens and the God... Well, The Godfather doesn't have inconsistencies. It's just really a great film. And I think I could... I might just go watch it again. Uh, I don't know what this whole story with Netflix is and stuff. Well, we are all watching Netflix. Yeah, but there's not that much on Netflix to watch. It gets very boring very quickly. And, and I think most of these modern films, you know, they're just not really that good. So you can't re-watch them. I mean, you can type in the comments... What what recent film could you possibly rewatch more than like twice? 
there are very few. Although that could just be a generational thing. I mean, it could be my generation. We don't mind rewatching things, but the, the current generation, who knows? That there is a bit of a. It's unclear which is the ox before the the cart in that question because maybe maybe movies were made in a different way in the past and they're more rewatchable and because today's demands are different and people are different so therefore they're not it's all you know i don't know whatever okay this was a very fun facebook live type of thing and i hope you've all watched it and enjoy your day and enjoy your lockdown you know don't don't get don't go don't get depressed in your lockdown there's much to do you know keep yourself you totally calm <laughs> and totally sane.